So, there is, so there is a slight delay between when I press my key here and when it updates on the, on the screen, just, just FY, FYI. Let's begin by uh, with uh, with black holes. So, so black holes they are objects. You know, in my opinion, they are fascinating objects. They are objects made of pure gravity, predicted by Einstein's general theory of relativity. So, in a black hole, as shown here, all matter is crushed into the central singularity. The interior, the interior of the black hole is a is a big mystery, actually. Uh, people think that the interior, the interior of black holes, they hold the keys to quantum gravity. But this talk, we will be safely uh, outside the black hole. So all the arena of what I will show here is safely outside the event horizon. So the radius of the event horizon, which is the surface of no return, the radius is called Schwarzschild radius. And it's a pretty pretty easy to compute the, the the radius of the event horizon. In other words, the radius of the black hole. Uh, and inside the event horizon, it's causally cut off from the external universe. Okay, so that's the the, the popular saying. You know, if you if you cross the event horizon, you cannot go back, and you will. And once you cross the event horizon, you will be doomed to meet with the singularity, with the mysterious singularity. So black holes are really the, 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 the bottom of very deep potential wells, uh, meaning that if you get close to a black hole, you will start experiencing pretty unique relativistic effects. You will start experiencing some pretty unique uh, features of curved space-time. So one thing that I find fascinating about black holes is that the space-time curvature is so strong that, it, that uh, if you shine, if you turn on a flashlight close to the event horizon, the space-time curvature is so strong that it can it, it makes a light rays orbit around the event horizon, just like planets around the sun. Okay, so that's I think it's pretty pretty incredible. And black holes are the only objects that where you can have this sort of uh, behavior of light. And actually, this orbiting of light rays around the event horizon is the key feature that we use to model the black hole shadow observed with the event horizon telescope. Okay. So it's pretty, pretty cool. And so the, the, the question I want to, to make you start thinking about is what happens when gas drops from a large distance onto a black hole? So for the purposes of this talk, uh, let's consider uh, let's consider a stellar mass black hole. In other words, a tiny, a petite black hole for astronomical standards. Okay, uh, a stellar mass black hole, which is basically the size of the Bay Area with a mass of a three solar masses. Okay, so it would fit nicely in the view in my view here. Uh, so what happens when you drop gas from a large distance into a stellar mass black hole? But the, but the, but the uh, the physics here applies to any sort of black hole, stellar mass black hole, supermassive black hole with masses of uh, bigger than a million solar masses as well. So you start dropping so nature, you know, black holes, you find black holes in places where there is a lot of gas around the black hole, okay? in the centers of galaxies or in binary systems where you have a, a star and the black hole, you know, is, 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 is draining matter from the star. But if you drop gas from far away into a black hole, uh, I'm sorry, you will not be able to hit the black hole directly. When you are dropping gas from far away, you know, the black hole is too small from far away, you will not hit it directly. The, the gas will have what we call in physics an impact parameter. The gas will have what we call in physics angular momentum. The gas will miss the target. However, the gas will form uh, because of the this cherished law of physics called the conservation of angular momentum. When you drop gas from far away into a black hole, it will actually form a disk, which is a combination of a conservation of angular momentum, which is basically if, why if you spin a wheel this, uh, in, a, in a bicycle, the wheel will keep spinning. Uh, this is the reason why you form a disk if you drop gas into a black hole. 
conservation of angular momentum combined with dissipation processes. And you end up forming not any kind of disk. You form what we call an accretion disk around a black hole. So an accretion disk, as I'm showing here, is a disk of gas around, around, a, around an object, in this case, a black hole. And it is accretion because the gas is accreting it onto the black hole. Okay, So the, 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 the disk is actually putting particles, depositing particles in the event horizon and increasing with time the mass of the black hole. In astronomy, we have lots of pretty pictures. Okay, so this is not this is not a real this is not an observation of a, of an accretion disk. Okay, just just to be clear, I wish we could make such beautiful pictures, but as you as you saw in the media, the first image of a black hole shadow doesn't look like much, even though it's the sharpest image ever taken by our species. But this is an illustration. Okay, an artistic representation of an accretion disk in a binary system. This is what it look. It will look like if you get if you got close to a to a black hole accreting matter. And now let's follow the energy. What happens with the energy of the gas as it uh, falls into the black hole? So initially, far away, most of the energy in the gas is in the form of gravitational energy. And then, as gas spiral inwards, spiral towards the black hole. The gravitational energy becomes kinetic energy, so the gas is moving, orbiting faster and faster and faster as it spirals inwards. And because of friction, some sort of friction, and then turbulence, this mechanical energy is converted into heat in the accretion disk. And eventually, there are two routes for the energy in particles falling into a black hole. The energy matter and energy can either get lost through the horizon or they can be radiated away as electromagnetic radiation. So let's say you are a computer scientist uh, or, you know, like you, uh, you are an engineer or you are a physicist that is not working in astrophysics. Why should you care about black hole accretion disks? You may be wondering. This, okay, black holes are pretty cool, but uh, I mean, besides that, you know, why should you care about black hole accretion? And I will give you one reason here. Let's compute <clears throat> the amount of energy released by particles as they fall in the accretion disk. So let's let's think a particle begins from in, let's consider from very far away. We say in physics from infinity, particles slowly spirals in in towards a black hole. The particles are losing energy, otherwise they would not approach the black hole. So the question is how much orbital energy is lost by particles as they come from very far away until the last orbit in the accretion disk, and when they finally dis disappear behind the event horizon. So the energy release, you can compute this as the difference in potential energy between infinity and the last stable orbit in the accretion disk around the black hole. It's a pretty, in physics, it's a pretty simple calculation in, in physics. You can do this using Newtonian physics. You get an order of magnitude estimate of the energetics of the accretion disk. And so you end up getting the binding energy of the last orbit is the, is the amount of energy released by gas as it falls from far away to close to the black hole. And the answer you get is actually pretty amazing. You can compute the matter of energy conversion efficiency of a black hole accretion disks. So I call this matter to energy efficiency, this eta, which is the ratio of the energy output from the, from the black hole accretion disk to the environment divided by the mass of particles feeding the black hole in the accretion disk. And this matter to energy efficiency is actually bigger than 10%. And pay attention, this has nothing to do with Hawking radiation, okay? There is no quantum physics here. There is no particle physics, actually. You can do this Newtonian calculation. And this is suggesting that black holes are pretty uh, powerful energy emitters. So let's uh, compare here, you know, because 
We are a nurse, you know, energy is in the name of this institute, so we should talk about energy. So the matter to energy efficiency of black hole accretion is bigger than 10%. Just, you know, for reference, the matter to energy efficiency of metabolism is one part in 10 billions. It's pretty small. We are pretty inefficient uh, engines, you know, we human creatures in, creatures in general. Wind power is 10 to the minus 14, the matter to energy efficiency. And I don't know why, but I put here as a scaling factor in the wind speed, 120 miles per hour. <laughs> it's a kind of an extreme example of uh, uh, wind power, but uh, anyway. Uh, and finally, nuclear fusion. Okay, with, uh, they're doing this in, uh, in Livermore, right? They're doing fusion experiments. The matter to energy efficiency of, the, of nuclear fusion is uh, about 0.1%. Um, okay. So it's pretty inefficient nuclear fusion compared to black holes. Okay. So, so that really makes black holes the most efficient energy sources in the universe. They are, in fact, the most powerful persistent engines in the universe, powered by gravitational potential energy of gas falling into black holes. And uh, just as a reference, you know, if you have only 50 grams of matter in, in an accretion disk, will, will, will return to the environment 150 gigawatt, gigawatts hour of energy, okay? So this is, this is basically the mass of a tennis ball in an accretion disk, okay? So why am I showing you this number? Because with, uh, with 50 grams of matter, you could power LBL for an entire year. Okay, so energy, LVL, that's the connection. Okay. But anyway, this is pretty, this is pretty, this is pretty, they are pretty powerful emitters, okay? So the main open questions in the field in black hole astrophysics, the main unresolved question in black hole astrophysics is what happens, what is the fate of the gravitational energy in the accreting matter? Does it come out as radiation? Does it come out as jets, or does it come out as uh, these uncollimated waves of, uh, uh, of, of particles? So this is an, uh, the main open question in the field. There are other important questions like the impact of this energy released by supermassive black holes on large scale structure in the universe and subgrade physics, but I will not talk much about this now. But we need to answer this first question, what's the fate of gravitational energy? Because there are many astronomical phenomena that uh, we think are powered by, that we think are powered by, <laughs> that we think are powered by, by black hole accretion. So one pretty important phenomenon is called active galactic nuclei. So basically a huge energy released by supermassive black holes at the centers of, the, of galaxies. And the first image of a black hole shadow by the Event Horizon Telescope was an image of a supermassive black hole, by the way, accreting matter from the surroundings in an accretion disk. We also have the phenomenon called X-ray binaries with stellar mass black holes. Also gamma ray bursts, which are pretty dangerous, actually pretty dangerous phenomena throughout the universe if you are close to one of them. Basically, when two stars, two neutral stars collide, explode, produces a baby black hole, and good luck if you are close to them when they merge. And also something called tidal disruption events, which is when a big black hole, when a, when a, when a star gets close to a big black hole, it gets tidally disrupted and good bye-bye uh, star. We actually observe all this phenomenon, okay? So now let's move on. Any any questions so far? Any questions from the Zoom audience or the physical audience here? Not yet. Okay. So let's uh, move on to to physics, more a bit more physics and traditional ways of simulating black hole accretion. So black hole accretion is a pretty complex nonlinear. There is pretty complex nonlinear physics involved. Too complicated to do analytically, unsurprisingly. So what you need to what you need to to do what you need to what you need in order to model black hole accretion, you need curved spacetime. 
you need a uh, you need to put gas around the black hole. And one very important thing here is that you need also need magnetic fields, okay? Because black holes are interacting with magnetized with plasma, okay? With charged particles, so it'll have magnetic fields, you have electric fields. So it gets pretty complicated, actually. So in order one, the main approach that we use nowadays to model black hole accretion and to understand the consequences of black hole accretion in the universe is an approach called GRMHD, which stands for General Relativistic Magneto Hydrodynamics. Okay. Magneto Hydrodynamics is abbreviated as MHD. So, magneto hydrodynamics is what happens when you combine fluid dynamics with electrodynamics. And then the general relativistic part is putting curve, all of this in curved space time. And what it amounts to is that you need to solve these uh, conservation equations. Okay, so it, so it doesn't matter what, I mean, if you are solving this, if you're writing a code, it does matter. Okay, but here for this, for this talk, it doesn't really matter what is written here. This is basically, the, these equations are ensuring that quantities, flowing quantities are conserved okay, through, as, as the fluid moves around. <clears throat> and the most commonly used GRMHD codes out there, here is a table of the most commonly used GRMHD codes, maybe in your work here uh, at NURSE, maybe, you know, maybe you've heard about it, probably not, I don't know, but in any case, I'm showing them here. So these are, these are the three main the, the three main codes. Some of them, more, they all started CPU only. Okay, so MPI codes. All of these codes they are based on what we call Godunov schemes, which is basically uh, solving something called a Riemann problem. Uh, but nowadays, it's because they move to GPU, they are massively parallel, uh, massive parallelized with CUDA and NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, most of them are open. One, the fastest one is not open. Here are the main developers in Illinois, Georgia, Princeton, and North Northwestern. And now I will show you one sample uh, GRMHD simulation of gas falling into, into a curved black hole. So you cannot see the black hole. There is a black hole at the middle there, but you cannot see because it's black. Uh -huh. Uh, and what will happen here, we will, let, we will let the black hole eat a donut of gas. Okay, so usually we start these simulations by putting a donut, a nice, a nice thick donut of gas around the black hole. And what happens here? is that as you start a simulation, and this is a pretty old simulation actually from 10 years ago, but as you run the simulation, there will be dissipation processes. There will be something called magneto, uh, magneto rotational instability, which dissipates angular momentum. The donut falls into the black hole, and then you have, have this swirling hot plasma uh, orbiting around the black hole. Depending on, there are many degrees of freedom here. Okay? So we have freedom to specify the magnetic topology around the black hole. We can change the spin of the black hole as we want. In this case, if you put a lot of magnetic field, if you feed the black hole with a lot of magnetic field and the black hole is spinning, you get jets out of this usually. Okay? So you get uh, outflows of uh, energy coming along the poles of the, of, the, of the angular momentum of the rotation of the, of the curved black hole. And there is a lot of fascinating physics really here. This, uh, so uh, there is a whole industry behind this black hole weather simulations for which the technical term is GRMHD simulation. Okay. Here, is, uh, here is another, oh, and by the way, talking about magnetic fields, uh, hmm. this is what the magnetic field structure looks like in these simulations. If, if you are familiar with the flying spaghetti monster, it looks like the flying spaghetti monster indeed, okay? And this is just a cut of the magnetic field topologies in the equator, okay? It's pretty messy in the equator, but surprisingly in the jet, it's pretty clean. So somehow there is order emerging from chaos, at least in the, in the, in the jet component of the simulation. Here is another fascinating simulation. It's a, it's a little bit old, it's from uh, five years ago. 
So here in this simulation, this is the simulation by the Northwestern uh, Georgia group, uh, Georgia Tech group, uh, where they feed the black hole with, uh, they basically misalign the donut with the, with, the, with the rotation of the black hole. And then, uh, and then basically some fascinating fluid dynamics happens and the disk breaks up in, in, uh, in several, uh, it's pretty complicated actually what happens here. And this is actually a CUDA, this is a GPU simulation ran in, uh, they ran in, in blue waters, okay. Maybe they are running simulations here, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, so this, so I just talked about conventional methods for simulating black holes. Let's have now move to the center, to the center of this talk, which is uh, machine learning methods. So from the from a couple of years ago, I got interested in trying machine learning methods for applying machine learning methods for black hole weather simulation. And the main que question that occurred to me is uh, can machines learn chaos and fluid dynamics? Or in other words, can we do a data-driven forecasting of large spatial temporally chaotic systems? In other words, can we replace this uh, uh, solving the partial differential equations by data-driven machine learning methods? And what really got me interested in this field of machine learning forecast is when I saw a paper a couple of years ago, which really impressed me. So on the left side here, we, so this is what really got me interested in, uh, in, in this to begin with. In the left plot here, in the, in the left side of the slide, you have uh, this author's path of Pathak et al. They solved a quite complicated nonlinear differential equation. So what you are seeing here is the solutions of this chaotic system, okay? And on the right side, we have the three-body problem, okay? The long-term evolution of a three-body problem, not the sci-fi novel, okay? This is actually the three-body problem, okay? Not also the Netflix series, which I haven't watched. By the way, I read only the first book. Uh, but then, you know, these authors, they use machine learning methods to forecast these chaotic systems, and they got some, in my opinion, mind-blowing results for this simple, simple, let's, let's, say, let's say, compared to astrophysical systems. On the, on, the, on the bottom panel here on the left side, on the bottom panel, this is the machine learning forecast for, for this system, okay? And what blows my mind here is that the machine learning forecast this is not a neural network, okay? This is, this is basically similar to a re recursive neural network. It's something called reservoir computing. And it holds, it holds pretty well forecasting the system for up to six Lyapunov of times, okay? So basically it controlled chaos for a very long time actually. And here on the, on the bottom right uh, plot for, for those of you watching on Zoom, you can see the machine learning forecast for the three body problem. Okay, so it's pretty similar. For a long time, uh, for, 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 uh, for the long term, it pre looks pretty similar to the actual solutions to the Newtonian equations. Okay, so this is really what, uh, you, uh, what caught my, uh, draw, drew my attention to, the, to this field. And my immediate question is does this work for astrophysical fluids and black hole weather? So the work I will present you now is uh, applying machine learning forecasting for black hole weather. So the idea here, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the idea here is feeding some machine learning model with data from black hole weather simulations, okay? And seeing if what comes out of the train model uh, is actually accurate and could maybe or replace the actual solutions to the partial differential equations. And as many of you know, as or perhaps most of you know, machine learning methods are usually much faster than, uh, than the numerical simulate, the traditional numerical simulations. Inference is very cheap. Uh, inference is very cheap once the machine learning models are trained. So this is a pretty interesting thing to investigate. And the question again, can machines learn fluid dynamics? So our training data set, we use some in-house uh, simulations in my group. 
The training data set comes from black hole accretion disk simulations. So here, the idea is let's uh, let a charge a black hole. In other words, a non-spinning black hole. Let the black hole accrete a gas donut. Solve this, the equations. So this is our training data set for our first pilot study in this subject. Okay. So this is the training data set. And we started playing with a convolutional neural network. Okay. So this is the this is basically what the conv, the conv net looks like. Uh, basically uh, run-of-the-mill convolutional neural network. This, this, this architecture that we play with is called UNAT. And we are we were using Renu activation, so nothing. Nothing non-standard here. Uh, and our training data, basically, we, were, we, we treat this black hole weather problem as a computer vision problem. Okay? So the idea here, we are exposing the machine to images of the flow. And by exploring the translation invariance of convolutions, we are hoping that the machine will be inspecting these images of turbulent flows. and. Somehow, well, that was our hope to learn turbulence by as a computer vision problem, exploring the translation, the nice properties of convolutions. Can I ask? Yeah, that, that you're doing like a just a two D image representation. So of this it? is a two D image representation. So we started we started with a two D image representation. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you use this regular like Euclidean coordinate system or you yeah. have to do some sort of transformation because of GR? We use uh, we use Euclidean coordinates. I, yeah, we use Euclidean coordinates. The original simulations were done in uh, 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 spherical coordinates, but then we converted to Euclidean just to make things uh, easier, you know? Sure. And we customize the loss, by the way. Like uh, we use some laws uh, adapted to the problem, basically adapted to, adapted to the to the distribution of gas. Okay, so the loss is a little bit uh, different, but uh, but yeah, it's a it's it's a two D computer vision problem. Okay, it's basically training to predict the future of the movie. Okay, training to predict the future of a movie. Okay, this slide is because I gave a matrix themed version of this talk. Okay, so uh, forget about this slide. Okay, <laughs> we can we, we can leave it for the discussion. What is your favorite matrix movie? The first, of course. <laughs> um, so this is the this is the result of this computer vision two D experiment. Uh, on the left side, you see the training data, one snapshot of the training data for the gas donut. Okay, so here, uh, uh, how can I describe for people on Zoom? So at the coordinate zero on the left, on the, on the left panel, you see there is a black hole there, even though you can't see because the black hole is tiny in the domain of the simulation, but there is a black hole there. So the left panel, the target, the data, the, the training data, Middle panel is the prediction of the neural net, the convolutional neural network, and residuals on the right panel. So this is an example of no ca uh, now casting. Okay? So for when you are doing your forecasting over short time scales, and by short I mean short time scales compared to the dynamical time scales of the system, it it would look like in principle the the conf net is doing pretty well. Okay? It looks like a, oh, and by the way, this is, so we train on, on several simulations. And then here for our testing, we did something pretty, uh, what we did here, we put a pretty static torus, okay? And we were testing whether the convolutional neural network would predict that the torus would remain stable, okay? That's a zero, that's a, the null hypothesis here, okay, the torus is pretty stable and the neural network should predict the torus which would should keep unchanged. Okay. Uh, that, that's the test I'm showing you here, by the way. So we thought, you know, that the neural network it seems to learn turbulence well in the short term. And for the now casting, it does the forecasting 10 to the four times faster than the simulation done in 200 CPUs in parallel. One GPU. Yeah, so this is, we, are, we were doing this in one GPU. Yeah. So all this training, we are not using the GPU clusters. We were using our server with two GPUs. Okay, so it's pretty, pretty cheap. 
nothing, nothing fancy. So for the now casting, basically one year of uh, traditional simulations was reduced to one hour with machine learning. Uh, okay, so then you would think, oh my God, it's amazing convolutional neural networks, they will solve all the problems in astrophysics. No, okay, because now we go to the, to the other side, okay? And I showed you only uh, 200 CPUs and CPU cores. Yes, I see some comment by Paul Lin. Yeah, uh, you mean cores or like yeah, yeah, processors? Yeah, CPU cores, yes, yeah. exactly. <clears throat> the thing is, I showed you only one part of the results, okay? Now, if, we, if I show you the longer term prediction for that pretty stable torus, okay? The torus stays stable, okay? So the, the neural network should predict that it remains stable, but it, that's not what it does on the long term. On the long, on the long term, so this is now the, this is now the, I guess the, 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 the red peel of the, the matrix. Uh, you can see on the, on the top panel that there is a pretty significant, pretty significant deviation of the deep learning prediction from the ground truth. So what I'm showing you here is marginalizing over angle, basically over marginalizing over one of the di physical dimensions of the system, showing you only R. So there is a, some model drifting happening, a pretty significant model drifting happening here. So the models are predicting variability where it should not be, which is basically a very uh, strong, uh, strong overfeeding. It drifts exponentially from reality. And when we looked in more detail to see where this uh, deviation from reality is happening, we noticed that actually the, the neural network is injecting mass into the domain of the simulation. So here is a, a, so you can see this. If you pay attention to the right corner here, it's showing the residual, the difference between the model, between the training data and the machine learning forecast. And what the neural network is doing here is injecting a lot of mass where it should not be. And the funny thing is that, so basically it looks like there are some ejections along the diagonals of the, of the torus there. And we actually see some, some sort of ejection that looks like this in actual weather forecast in, in GRMHD models of black holes. But here, this should not be happening, okay? not in this particular simulation. So this is an example of the fact that standard methods, and here in this case, a convolutional neural network is the standard method in this case. It, it, it lacks generalization for this type of forecasting. It's an accurate away from the training domain. Okay, so this is a pretty, pretty big problem. You didn't have that stable donut or whatever in the training data. It was only like no, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah right. or we, were, we were training on turbulent. Turbulent motion. We have one or one or two kind of stable, stable models, but then we, when testing, it just fails. Okay. Yeah. So this this motiv this catastrophic failure motivated us to explore other approaches. So then we explore something called neural operators. So let's now talk about the second approach that we took in our black hole weather forecasting: neural operators. So neural operators, they are triggering, triggering lots of uh, interest in the community, spe specifically in, in people interested in solving partial differential equations, like people in the fluids community, earth weather forecasting, and in my case, black hole weather forecasting. So a new, what is a neural operator? <clears throat> a neural operator, it learns the solution operator for a partial differential equation. Uh, a neural operator, when, it's, when, when it learns a solution, it generalizes well, even when you have different conditions away from the training data set, and it's supposed to be mesh invariant. So if you change the, the mesh of your simulation, you would not need to retrain your neural operator. So that's pretty uh, interesting in my opinion. So what you're what I'm showing you here is the typical architecture for a neuro for these neural operators. This looks like a RASNAT. It looks like it kind of looks like a, if if you know what I'm talking about, look like this uh, 
RAS NATs of uh, neural networks. So pretty, pretty, uh, anyway, stack layers, one, one after the other. Uh, uh, and what, what is important for us here are the yellow layers, the layers of integral operators and the activation functions. And then we zoom in in one of these layers. So the yellow box here, we have basically a convolution operator with a, con with a kernel K and this uh, uh, weighting, var weighting variable me. Okay? So the crux of for the neural operators is that you can, you can choose whatever kernel you want depending on the problem. Okay? So that's where all the user specifications and the physics informed learning, they go here in this, in this uh, convolution. You can choose the kernel that is more, more appropriate for your, for your problem, okay? So we, the kernel we chose, any, any questions? Um, there were some, but not related to this, and maybe they'd be good for the end of the... Yeah, okay. And then, uh, and then the particular kernel we chose is something called Fourier neural, Fourier neural operator, okay? So the specific neural operator that we are using here is uh, we chose the S kernel, the Fourier transform. So in other words, sines and cosines to represent the, the, the data. Uh, so just we, we can make an image to image analogy. If you, are, if you come from a convolutional neural network background, okay, using an image to image an, an analogy, this is similar to a comb net, okay? But instead, but just replace, well, not just, but basically think of it as replacing the convolution layer with a Fourier layer instead of a convolution neural network. Okay? So basically that's what, what's happening here. And this is pretty uh, relevant for fluid simulations because you, you know, a fluid is basically waves interacting among them, okay? Sines and cosines interacting. So it makes sense to choose a Fourier representation for your training data, okay? You know, machine learning is all about how you represent your data. And fluids are wave-like solution transporting uh, quantities. And okay, so then we decided here to downscale the problem from black holes. <laughs> so what we did here, we were going back to the fundamentals. We removed gravity, <laughs> we removed the black hole, uh, but we kept the fluid and the magnetic fields. And we decided to apply this Fourier neural oper operator to a simpler problem. Okay. Again, we want to understand the fundamentals. So we decided to ap apply the Fourier neural operator to a problem called Ortec tank vortex. This is a classical magnetohydrodynamics problem. It's 2D. So basically the idea here is that you specify an initial condition. There is no gravity here, okay? It's a 2D, a 2D problem. So basically we specify a vortex. Initial condition is a vortex, constant density everywhere. And you have also vortex of B. And what happens here is that as the flow evolves, you develop turbulence and you develop actually shocks. And the reason why we pick this problem is because this is a classic test problem for uh, numerical simulations of uh, magneto MHD simulations, okay? No, again, no gravity. We're, we are scaling down the problem to understand we gain neural, operate, uh, neural operators. By the way, uh, it occurred to me that you know, if you are not familiar with uh, magnetohydrodynamics, it sounds like an experimental electronic band. It sounds like the name of an experimental electronic band, magnetohydrodynamics, in my opinion. But anyway, so the training data here we generated again for numerical simulations. Now we, we chose a different code called Fargo 3D. So it's an MHD code parallelized with uh, CUDA. GPU, GPUs, we use a library, we, 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 we created a library of 50 models varying the parameters of, uh, of the flow. Small resolution, okay, 128 pixels by 128 uh, pixels Cartesian. And each model spans a thousand frames, which uh, if you care about that's a few often times for the system. This is what this is the behavior of the uh, I 
It's the magnitude of the velocity vector. Okay, results. Results. So uh, now I will show you the forecasting results for uh, what the color here maps the magnitude of velocity vector. Okay, that's what the color is mapping here. Left is the data original the, the original data, the test data. Middle is the prediction of the neural of the Fourier neural operator, and this is the the minimum square, the the square error. Okay. So let's go. Okay. So if you pay attention to this, you can see that it's actually holding up the, the neural operator forecasting is that actually holding up pretty well. I mean, looking with the naked eye here, uh, it looks the, the, the prediction of the neural operator is pretty, looks pretty much like the, the target data. Now, when you look at the, at, the, at the error, at the MSC, you can see that there are, you know, like a re particularly problematic regions and these regions are actually correlated with shocks, with the occurrence of shocks in the in the system. So uh, the neural operator has a hard time understanding uh, regions where you have shocks. And if you look here at the at the cumulative difference, you know it builds up. If you do the average over time, it goes up to ten to about ten percent. Okay. So there is still a long way to go to get this uh, cumulative difference down to the, the machine precision, okay? But this is much, much better than what the, the results from the, from the convolutional neural network. So in my opinion, this holds a, holds a lot of promise for fluid dynamics using neural operators instead of more uh, standard uh, machine learning techniques. So uh, for the sake of time, okay, I will just mention two other things that my, that I have my group has been doing in the past. Okay, and I cannot do this. Why is this not working? Just uh, you know, because uh, there might be a, a HPC folks in the audience, I will mention some. Uh, first, another application of machine learning that we did was. Uh, Basically, as a turbo, uh, as a fast interpolator. Okay, so one thing is that sometimes when we when we need to compute electromagnetic spectra out of these systems, out out of the shining hot gas around the black hole, generating this spectra is pretty slow. Okay, and then depending on the model you use, you cannot really do statistics with the models because it takes a long time to generate spectra. So one thing we did. Uh, so we trained a deep learning method. It's not a convolutional. It's just a forward uh, network. It's not a convolutional neural network to replace the model with uh, deep learning. Okay, and this is a pretty pretty nice uh, uh, application of of machine learning to as a fast interpolator on a grid of models. And because of this, what was before impossible now it is possible. We can do Bayesian inference. Previously, the model took one minute per spectra. Now, with thanks to machine learning, it takes uh, less than a less than a millisecond. So this is a, this was a paper uh, led by my student Ivan Ivan Almeida, a deep learning by Asian inference for for acting galactic nuclei. And the other thing that I wanted to mention to the HPC folks here is that another project we are working on is. Uh, Again, black hole weather forecasting, we want to understand how this get hot gas shines because that's what we observe with our telescopes. Okay, we see light shining coming out of the hot gas. And we need to model radiative transfer, how this hot gas shines. We need to do something called radiative transfer in curved space times. In other words, understand how photons, they, when they are generated in the accretion disk, they propagate to the observer. And uh, there is one specific uh, way of approaching this, which was actually implemented in OpenMP, which are using the pragmas, you know, like uh, for HPC folks, the pragmas, you know, pretty. There, there was a lot of potential for accelerating this uh, radiative transfer using, and, uh, using GPUs. So we are working on, on porting this code to, to NVIDIA CUDA. And we are we have some pretty pretty uh, promising 
preliminary results, okay, we are testing the kernel. So basically we wrote CUDA kernels, a lot of CUDA kernels for propagating these phot photons, generating photons, absorbing, propagating curved space times. And this is working collaboration with Pedro, Pedro Mota in Sao Paulo. Anyway, so this is what I, uh, for the sake of time, uh, this is what I wanted to share with you guys. Machine, le machine learning and black holes, convolutional uh, summary, long story short, so, uh, convolutional neural networks, they, they learn the short term evolution of the black hole flow patterns. The short term is okay, it is blazing fast, but of course you don't want a method that is uh, it's fast and wrong, okay? You want a method, a method that is fast and correct. And for the long term, it violates the convolution neural networks, they violate mass continuity, overfitting. And then when we test a neural operators, not for a black hole flow, but a simple, without a, a, a flow without gravity, but with magnetic fields, neural operators seem to be very promising because they have a better physical representation of the, what's actually happening in the fluid. And we plan to apply this in the future to black hole flows as well. And I can envision a future where AI, I would say probably in 20, 30 years, maybe shorter than that. But uh, in general, I know that in Earth weather, weather forecasting, this is already happening. But I envision a future where in 20, 20 years, Machine learning methods we re replace them could replace numerical solvers, and certainly NERSC has a big, major role. We will have a major role in this. That's it. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the great talk, Rodrigo. Awesome stuff. Great animations. Probably could have submitted some of that to the recent like HPC is art competition <laughs> that we had. There were like animation categories and like oh, I certainly would have voted for some of those. Yeah. Um, uh, we have some time for questions. There were a couple that were still uh, we're back here on Zoom. Maybe I can. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention this work was funded by several several funding sources. I forgot to mention that we, we collaborated with an NVIDIA partner early on in this work. Uh, and NVIDIA, I just wanted to acknowledge NVIDIA donated to us a couple of GPUs for this work early on. So we were have, very happy to have a, uh, an NVIDIA partner early on. Yeah, yeah they're, they're a beneficial partner in a lot of yeah. <laughs> Our colleagues work with them a lot on the weather forecasting. Um, Nestor here online was talking about a paper from DeepMind uh, I'm not sure exactly which one he's talking about, but I guess some forecasting problem where they would introduce noise simulation in order to improve long-term accuracy. Have you have you considered that or something like that? No, that's a, that's a, that's Nestor. Uh, th that's a great idea, Nestor. Uh, I I saw the DeepMind forecasting paper, but I we didn't think about introducing noise. I would be interested in learning exactly how they how they do the noise, how they put noise in the training data, uh, which probably is similar to drop out techniques, I guess. Like, uh, uh, yeah, no, very. Thank you, very interesting. Yeah, maybe Nessa can share the reference. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Peng Fei had a question, although maybe the answer was neural operators. Um, mm -hmm. it, I think it's still an interesting question. So just uh, kind of how far in the future can you actually extrapolate along the time axis? Do these simulation results become overly smoothed? Oh, okay. Uh, for the a few ways to interpret that question. For the neural operators, I guess. Well, so okay, let me answer the question broadly. For for the for the convolutional neural network case. It was not very good, you know, not for the long term, but like uh, the relevant time scale for the for the black hole Donald case was something we call viscous time. And way before it approaches the viscous time, the, the, the convolutional net drifts exponentially away from the ground truth. Now for the neural operator, we didn't see, so the thing is for this, for this particular vortex system, uh, what, what's the name of the person asking? Okay. Huh? Peng Fei. Peng Fei. Hey, Peng Fei. Uh, <laughs> uh, for this part, for the for the magnetic vortex I showed you. Um, so what happens is naturally, so again, oh, 
So there are periodic boundary conditions and naturally as the flow evolves, it dissipates energy, okay? Energy cascades down to the smaller scales and the flow, even in the training data, the flow naturally becomes more homogeneous, okay? The shocks dissipate. Uh, but for the all the, so the thing is for the entire duration of the training data set, the neural operators had a pretty good behavior actually. We didn't see anything catastrophic happening comparing the models with the data for the span of our training data, okay, for the for the test, sorry, test data, okay? So I, does that, I hope that answers your question. And by the way, the relevant, I don't think it, maybe it matters, but you know, it's the, we, the training data we simulated for a couple of Altman times, okay, which is the time magnetic disturbance takes to travel through the box. So that's the relevant time scale there. Okay? Anybody cares? <laughs> yeah. Like, what about like that simulations? Those cool animation of like traditional simulations you showed. What are the like? I mean, like way back the the cool like visualization ones. What were the time scales for those? Like, how fast was time going? If that was like a realistic size? Yeah. So, uh, so the duration of the of the of the, of the fancy simulations I show are the all they are comparable to the black hole simulation we train the convolutional okay. network. Okay. So the the the, the relevant time scale is the viscous time scale, and yeah. then they are they start approaching. They are comparable to the vis. They are, nowadays we are all starting to 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 because of Moore's law basically, we are able to simulate systems close to getting close and closer and closer to the viscous time scale. But like, I guess I'm wondering, were we watching uh, something that's close to real time in those with where you oh, showed like, for example, like the tilted, tilted uh, ones? Or are like, you asking the, from cold units of time to real time? Yeah. Ah, yes. That's uh, those early animations you had that looked really cool. Oh, that's your question. I'm curious, just uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, like this, right? Were we watching one day worth of real time or? Okay. Uh, it's okay if you don't know. No, no, I, I know, I know, but the answer is a bit subtle because for black holes, the, the duration of the, of the system scales with the mass of the black hole, okay? Yeah. Lower mass black holes, things happen faster. So for the same duration here, okay, for us, if there was a stellar mass black hole, in other words, a black hole the size of the Bay Area, all of this happened in less than a second in real time. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, for a supermassive black hole the size of the solar system, this is less than one minute. So, sorry, sorry, sorry. For, for, for a supermassive black hole, this is... Uh, this is a couple of days. This is a couple. Okay. I'm, I'm doing very rough calculations in my head. Yeah, I'm just trying to get a little intuition for how fast yeah. it's really going. So, so basically, this is uh, less than a second for a stellar mass black hole. To get the duration in real, in physical units, so supermassive black hole, you have to multiply this by 10 million. Okay, so that's actually a couple of days, perhaps months yeah. in real time. Um, Okay, we are a bit over hours, so if people need to drop, they can, but there are a couple questions more still I could uh, feed to you. Any questions in the room, by the way? Um, uh, Poen had one here. Uh, that first example where you're doing CNNs on the 2D case, uh, it's a question about um, uh, symmetry. The prediction is not symmetrical along the z-axis. Uh, do you expect this problem will be alleviated with neural operators? Or are there other ways to force that the model learns the spatial symmetry of the problem? Yeah. So, who, who is asking me the question? A uh, Poen. Poen, hey Poen. <laughs> uh, Hi, very nice talk. Oh, thank you. Hey, <laughs> nice to hear back from the boy. <laughs> uh, They're you, real people. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, Okay, so this would be a yeah. So that's the promise of a neural operators that they they have a mesh free representation of the data because it's actually learning the solution operators. But one caveat here is that uh, I think that 
when we apply the neural operators to black hole stuff, we will need to probably change the, 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 the specific kernel, the specific operator, the specific neural uh, uh, kernel that we use. Because for the following reason, the Fourier neural operator, uh, it works best with periodic boundary conditions, okay? Because you have a sines and cosines which go on for infinity, okay? Mm -hmm. So they, they, they really shine, and this is something I didn't mention during the talk, but the, 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 the vortex that I showed in the last part of the talk had periodic boundary conditions, okay? Perfect for a Fourier, Fourier neural operator. In this case, the, it's not periodic boundary, well, along the pole, it's periodic boundary conditions, but not along the far away from the black hole, okay? It's not periodic. So I think we'll have to change the specific details. So one thing I'm curious about is, uh, this doesn't exist yet. It doesn't exist, but uh, something that I'm curious about is trying something like a wavelet neural operator, okay? So wavelets is a representation of the data, particularly when it's not periodic boundary conditions, okay? Another possibility here would be replacing the Fourier transform with a Laplace transform, okay? I have to think more about this, but that's a very interesting question, thank you. We get periodic boundary conditions if you go to the the, the spherical surface, right? Or the, the even the three D volume. That's no, no, not not if you go far away in the radial distance. If you go far away, it's not oh, at that boundary. Yeah, it's, oh, it's right, not right, periodic right. here. Yeah, yeah, so okay. it's periodic along the. So there is a reflection symmetry here along the cylindrical along the z axis. Okay, there it, it's 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 a periodic, but not far away. Okay. I understand. So that's a problem for using Fourier neural operators for this particular case. But I can think, as I said, I can think of changing the, oper the, the operator to circumvent this limitation. Okay, okay. cool. Uh, yeah, I, I think we should probably cut it off now in the interest of lunch and in people's time, but uh, let's thank Rodrigo again one more time. Thanks. Thanks for being here.